<laughs> yes, sir. So could you um, introduce yourself? Um, I started recording, so we'll be able to use this later. Could you introduce yourself, what you do, and how you came about to write this uh, book? Okay, uh, my name is Uzon Goladi. Um, <laughs> let me say I'm an accidental activist, <laughs> all right? I did educational psychology, I earned a PhD in educational psychology from University of Lagos. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm basically a writer. I also publish www.dailyblastng.com. And uh, what other thing? I do a lot of uh, businesses here and there. I also, I'm also into real estate, you know, so I do a whole lot. You know, in Nigeria, you can't just, you can't just stick to one. But exactly. I'm basically, <laughs> I'm basically a writer and I've also been having, I, I had a stint with acting, with the acting profession, you know, but <laughs> for about two years now, I just dropped it and focused more on my writing and activism. You know, I've written about five books now. Uh, hashtag answers is my third book. I've got four daughters. <laughs> That's good. Solid. Yeah, this is this is all great to hear, sir. So you're really doing a lot of different things, dabbling a lot of different things, you know. Um, solid, solid. That, that's really great to hear. And so how did you, like to start off, how did you come to the place where you're like, I need to write a book on NSARS, on impunity, on police brutality? Where, where did that like journey begin? Well... I've been a victim of police brutality. You know, I've seen a lot of cases where police uh, men are brutalizing and extorting young people in Nigeria. And I've always frowned at that, you know, I believe it's unacceptable, you know. Then when the, the, hashtag, the hashtag answers have started for, for about four years, we see it on Twitter every time. And I always comment on it. I always feel very bad because I've been a victim myself. So when last year in October, young people in Nigeria took it upon themselves to express their, their disgust about this issue of police brutalizing them and police classifying every young man as a, a Yahoo boy, as a fraudster, you know, because maybe when you dress well or you're driving a good car, the police will arrest you and they will want to torture you and extort you, you know. So the, the first, the very first, um, the very first protests started in Abuja. Actually, I was walking down to my office. I ran into the protesters at the police headquarters because my, my office in Abuja is close to police headquarters. I ran into them. I met Showore there. I met uh, Aisha Yusufu. I know you'll be familiar with these names. I met Deji Adeyanju. I met uh, Shehu Sani, Senator Shehu Sani, who's also an activist. And the crowd of other people protested, so I quickly joined them. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. You know, I joined them. And after that, that was on Thursday. The next Saturday, the, I think on Friday, I saw on Twitter that they want to still organize another fresh protest at, at, the, at the Beggar Bridge in Abuja. So I knew I would participate fully in it. So I, on Saturday morning, I just, I just went straight to Beggar Bridge, joined them. And we marched down from, uh, from that beggar bridge to Unity Fountain and from Unity Fountain to police headquarters again, where the police started uh, uh, tear gassing us, started pouring water on us, started harassing us, you know, in a bit to, to disperse the crowd, you know. Then after that, again, I went to Lagos within that week to do something else. I still ran into protests within the Lake Aja axis. So I also joined them. So I saw everything that happened on the street. I saw the, I was able to witness the, 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 the frustration of Nigerian youths, you know, Nigerian youths who are very much disillusioned. I was able to meet people who's, uh, who lost their dear ones to police brutality, you know, who has been extorted. I saw a lot of young women, and by the way, kudos to Nigerian youths, kudos to them. They really tried, you know, nobody can claim to be the organizer of the protests. Everybody just came out voluntarily to say, we don't want this, this needs to stop. So after all my experiences, I was also as a media person reporting it on my, uh, on my website, www.dailyblastng.com. You know, I was also reporting, then I also went online. I saw a lot of scattered information, information everywhere. The data was so much that you don't know which one to pick. You don't know how to uh, piece them together. So 
I just decided that it's time to bring out a book on this. It's, it's time to write. You know, the writing, the writers, the writer's instinct in me, you know, yeah. pushed me to start writing. And I began writing it. And uh, after some time, I just felt, ah, let me just leave this thing and wait to see how the the entire uh, the aftermath of the protest, how it pans out, you know. I spoke to some of my friends and said, no, 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 we need to document what has happened already. You know, so go ahead. We want this book out like tomorrow. So that was what fired my that was what fired my curiosity, and I began to write. That's good. That's solid. So this so this is like all happening like October 2020. The protests begin. You join the protest, and then you're just like, I gotta write this book. I gotta put it out there. So it kind of just kind of like happened naturally for you. Yeah, that's that's interesting to hear, sir. Uh, I appreciate yes. that. Um, it, it was cutting out. It just cut out for a second when I started speaking. Can you hear me normally? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's solid. Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's good. So let's get to some of the. Um, specific questions um all right the protests of police brutality i think you and i probably agree <laughs> that nigeria has a culture of corruption i've been studying this for my third chapter of my thesis and the amount of corruption i have seen throughout nigeria's history is astounding just in the last 10 years the type of thing that have happened um and so i want to ask you what do you think is the root of police corruption? Because there has to be a reason why there is corruption. It can't just be, oh, there's corruption. There has to be a root. What do you think is the root of the corruption in the police? Well, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, it may. Can you it, hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It may be better if if maybe I turned off my camera when you speak, because sometimes that can be the reason that they slow down. Okay. Okay. Hello. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. I just turned Hello, off can my. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just turned off my camera so that it could come through clear. Okay. Yeah. You can come what? Okay. Uh, first of all, corruption has been institutionalized in Nigeria. All right. Um, over the years, from the from the time we we are experiencing the the military government in Nigeria or the the successive uh, military junta's, they have institutionalized corruption. People come into government because they want to make money for themselves, you know, out of greed. They want to settle their own cronies. They want to uh, kind of uh, acquire ill-gotten wealth, uh, generations, you know. And with time, the civil service, the government agencies and parastatals, which you know that the police is part of, it was also the same thing. So. The, 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 the average policeman in Nigeria is not in, really interested in the security of the country. He's not interested in securing the, the citizens. He's more interested in what goes into his pockets. He, he wants to engage in bribery and corruption in spite of whatever anybody might think. And they are very clear about it. For instance, in Nigeria, you will see written everywhere, bail is free. Bail is not free. You know, if a policeman arrests you now and you're taken to the station, first of all, you 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 have to you have you have to part with a, a considerable amount of money before they let you go. So corruption in in, in in the police is more or less like a culture. It has been institutionalized. Every policeman you know, the ones that are that are going to be recruited, all they have at the back of their minds is how they would they would milk money. From the from the citizens. Secondly, when you when you look at the the police salary structure, you look at their remuneration, you look at um, where they live, you look at the the entire package that is given to them, you know, as remuneration. You see that it's nothing to write home about. You, you can't compare it with, with what we see in a, in other parts of the country. I've been to Germany. I've been to America. I've seen policemen. I've seen how they are, how respectable they are. I, I, I see that 
the, the profession is taking good care of them. They make enough money to take care of them and their needs. But if you come down to Nigeria where a policeman earns maybe less than $100 in a month, how do you expect him to survive with that? So in, 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 in fairness to them, they are also frustrated. They need money to survive. They need to send their children to school. They need to, they need to cut out for the general welfare of their families. So because of that, they, need, they, they, they feel that there's this need to make extra, to collect money, you know, to turn the profession into, uh, uh, like, like uh, Fela Nekolabo Kuti said, the police station is now a bank where people come to deposit money. You cannot go to the police station without parting with money. So corruption is institutionalized in Nigeria, not only the police. Mm -hmm. And that is the impunity that we are, we, are, we, are, we are kicking against right now. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I feel that so much. I, I researched the, the police salary structure for my second chapter of my thesis. And um, what I found is that the average police officer is paid about $500 a month. Right? right, that's like it's almost six thousand a year. Um, right. if that's correct, if I if I calculated that correct, I just know that it's yeah. It no no sorry. Look, it's uh, it's five thousand eight hundred and sixty eight dollars a year, average police officer, compared to okay. sixty compared to sixty seven thousand a year in the United States for the average officer. The the the, the difference, that's like tenfold. That's like a ten. Like that's like times 10 of the difference. It's like, that's not even like, they're not making almost anything. And so there's a level to which I like, I'm like, I understand, but also that doesn't excuse it. You know, like that doesn't excuse what they're doing because you cannot, you cannot take out your frustration on, oh, this guy has a nice phone. I want his phone. It's like, no, the government needs to change. Yeah. And the reality is that if most police officers are doing it out of frustration, the police officers should have joined the protesters in protesting the government's handling of their funds rather than coming for the people. I feel it's that. True. Yeah. True. So I absolutely agree with you. Yes, sir. So um, I think my next question is, let me let me uh, check through the questions. There's a, a serious question I have is what are in what ways would you compare NSARS to other political protests and how is it different? For instance, what is the difference between Black Lives Matter and NSARS? Because there is some difference. I definitely see that there's a difference there. I would want to know what your thoughts are on that. Okay, I feel, I feel that um, the NSARS protest is peculiar to us as Nigerians. You know, as young people in Nigerians, especially because um, we've not really had good governance. You are in Europe, <laughs> you see the infrastructure there, <laughs> you see the good life. You know, when you come out from uh, from school, you're able to get a job. But one of the significance of uh, NSTAR's protests is the high rate of unemployment. That is what it signifies. You know, and uh, that was why I also started the, the Unemployed People of Nigeria movement. You know, I'm the convener of Unemployed People of Nigeria because I realized that from the protests, a lot of a lot of young people who should be pro productive, who should who should wake up in the morning and go to their place of work, who are really eager to work and contribute their quota to national development, they don't have where to go. To. They do not have work. And the recruitment in Nigeria right now is, is in a very terrible shape. You know, there's employment buying, employment has been monetized, there's employment racketeers everywhere. So if you don't have uh, maybe one million naira or five hundred thousand, you know, you you know you will not be able to get a job. That means employment has been monetized. Secondly, employment has been sexualized in Nigeria. You know, employers demand for sex before you can join any of the government agencies, ministries, or parastatals, you must have to pass with money or sex or connection, the way we call it in Nigeria. That means you're connected to either a senator or a commissioner or a governor or even the president. You know, so you, you see that the government have not done anything about it because they are the direct beneficiaries, all right? When their children, after their children must have uh, finished their education from outside the country, because the universities we have here they are not really functional. They still come back here and they fix them, you know, in the civil service. 
without considering those people who are less privileged, without considering people who cannot afford to pay for employment. You know, so NSAS is not only about police brutality and uh, extortion. It's also about all the impunity that we have experienced in this country as young people in the past maybe uh, uh, 20 years or 30 years. You know, people are not able to get things on merit. You know, employment in Nigeria is supposed to be based on merit. It's supposed to be transparent. It's supposed to be free and fair. The government should be an equal opportunity employer, but we are not seeing all this, especially since this APC government came into power since 2015. I can tell you right here that no employment has, no recruitment has ever taken place in Nigeria since 1915 that is free and fair. I'm also a victim of it. After my PhD, I've applied to not less than 35 universities in Nigeria here, yeah, and they keep demanding either connection or one million naira or sex before they can even look your way. None of them have been able to say, okay, let's let's give you let's let's give you uh, uh, the, the opportunity. Come and let's see what you, you got to offer. Let's see whether you are truly qualified to teach in any of these higher institutions. What they do is who sent you. If you don't have a note from a senator or from a House of Rights member or from a minister, nobody looks your face, looks at your face. Secondly, you see other people who, who are demanding money from you. If you don't have one million naira, uh, um, some ministries right now demand as much as three million naira, four million naira before you can be employed. So tell me now, if you pay to get into the federal civil service or state civil service, how are you going to give your best? What we have today in most of the ministries and parties are just uh, miscreants, you know, charlatans, people who have nothing to offer because they were not qualified. There, there was no aptitude tests. <laughs> there was no recruitment. There's no, uh, you know, there's no due process in getting these things done. So hashtag instance pro protest is quite different from every other protest. For instance, the Black Lives Matter, they are just talking about how blacks are humiliated, how the face of crime, how, how being a black man has become the face of crime in the United States of America, you know, and they are seeking uh, protection from the government. You know, they are agitating that they should be, they should be treated equally with people from other races in, um, in America. It's quite different from what we have here in Nigeria, you know. So that was why we came out to the on the Say want you to stop to put a stop to to things that are hot. Yes, sir. Um, that was good. I appreciated that. Um, I think that there's a that is that is the, that is a key distinction that needs to be made because it's more about and SARS. Every person I've interviewed has said that. And SARS is primarily about reform of the entire country rather than simply reform of, it's not a racial issue, it's, it's, a, it's a country issue. It's the impunity that happens throughout the, the country. I, I would wanna get your thoughts on this, on the, on the Lecky Tollgate situation, right? So, so far I, I'm following this. I think recently Reddington hospitals came and they spoke at the judicial panels and they said we yep. had people who had, we took a lot of people that night of October 20th and they had pellets uh, in them. And the, when that yep. happened, the army pulled out of the judicial hearings. Is that, is that correct? Am, am I remembering that correct? They yes, yes, you're correct, you're correct. Which they're like, I don't know, like, I don't know if they, like, if, if the army really thinks that they're innocent, wouldn't they remain and prove their case? but instead they pulled out. That's a little bit strange. And so I wanna get your thoughts on how the government has handled the Lekki Tollgate investigation um, because it's a very interesting thing. Like basically the mainstream media, most Nigerians and people outside of Nigeria, we all kind of believe there was a clear shooting and incident that night where 12, about 12 to 15 people's lives were, that we know of were taken at the Lekki Tollgate. But the government wants to argue only one person was killed through brute force trauma. 
So what is your take on their handling of the investigation? Well, we cannot forget for a very long time, you know, we must get to the roots of what actually happened at the Lake Ito Gate. And the government must take responsibility because somebody ordered the soldiers to go to Lake Ito Gate on the 20th of October, 2020, to shoot innocent Nigerians, young Nigerians who were waving the Nigerian flag, seated on the floor and reciting the, 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 the national anthem. The army had the guts to open fire into the crowd and it's, it's, it's quite un, un, unfortunate, it's despicable. And after that, the Nigerian army has not, uh, they, 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 they've not been able to come up with any tangible excuse for what they did. You can see how the judicial panel of inquiry is going on and they pulled out of it because they know that they are obviously guilty. It's obvious that the Nigerian army is guilty. They show that these people, and they show with live bullets. First of all, they were demanding that they were, they were, they were, uh, how do I put it now? They were saying that they did not open fire, <laughs> first of all. Then again, they said, okay, they actually opened fire, but they fired blank blanks, blank, blank bullets. Then when they were confronted with the, with the pellets, the bullets, the extended bullets that were found on the ground, they, 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 you know, they couldn't defend themselves. You know, so they are, they are coming up with a whole lot of excuses trying to deny the allegation, which is very true. A lot of people were shot. A lot of people were injured. People lost their lives at the Lickie Tool Gate on that 28th of October. And there's nothing anybody can, 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 can do to deny what actually happened. Then again, the judicial panel of inquiry recently wanted to reopen the Lickie Tool Gate. And young people resisted that by going to the Lekito Lucky, Lucky Gate again to stage a protest. They were not even allowed to protest. <laughs> I'm telling you, they were not allowed because a day before, before that Saturday, on Friday evening, the policemen fully kitted, armed to the teeth, were all deployed to the, to the toll plaza. And in the morning, any young person they see trying to move around that area was just uh, arrested. They were arrested, a whole lot of them put into Black Marias, they were brutalized, they were humiliated. You know, there's nothing the Nigerian youth has not seen in the hands of, uh, of, 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 of this current APC government that, have, that, that are determined to inflict pain on Nigerians. It, it's, it's as if they are punishing us for giving them the opportunity to be in power. You know, for the last six years now, we, we've not seen, all the changes we have seen is changed for the worse. You know, the country is getting worse and worse. The, 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 the cost of living is, has sky, skyrocketed. You know, people cannot afford their, their daily needs any longer. People are not allowed to speak out. You know, they are trying to, to stifle dissenting voices. They are trying to uh, uh, kind of destroy democracy. You know, so what, what, what we see today is, is a kind of, is more or less a military government. You know, we don't have democracy again. And don't forget that when Buhari came into power, via military coup in 1981, you know, what did he do? He messed up the democracy. He truncated a democratically elected government. Now, there is something years after, he's here again, and he's messing up the democracy that we are, we've been building and we've been working on. And he has never contributed anything to democracy. You know, so that is why we are determined to ensure that we do not allow Buhari and his co-travelers to, to, to catch us. You know, to gag us. We keep speaking out. We keep going to the streets to protest. Even on social media, there's also a whole lot of online protests on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, name it, this media. Because if we keep quiet, we will all drown and the country will, would, would be in reverse mode. You know, they have, they have put the country in reverse mode for like 100 years back. You know, we cannot quantify the level of damage that we have witnessed in this, in this government. So they must take responsibility for what happened at the Lekki toll gate. It will not be, it will, it, will, it will not allow anybody to sweep it under the carpet. Yes, sir, we agree on that. Um, I've been uh, looking through the history of 
just the coup. I mean, we had coup after coup after coup after coup until 1993, where it was the last coup. Senia Baja was ruling till 19. I don't I'm probably butchering his name, but Senny was ruling from 1993 to 1998. He died. 1999, a general took his place. And then, uh, you know, we tried to get democratic and started being a little bit more normal yeah. on that. Um, but I think that there's this such a naturalized tendency towards corruption in Nigeria that it's like, what is it really possible to be done to reverse these issues? You know, because it's like, if you, for instance, I'm just going to point this out because I was tracking it. So I was talking with uh, uh, CF founder, uh, 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 Mr. Shegun Awasanya, about okay. uh, all these different things and the reform bills and stuff like that. And they talked about how there's a police reform bill, which I looked through the stipulations in it, and they're actually pretty decent. Like, they actually do reform some things. But that reform bill was passed a month before all these things started happening. It was actually the 17th, I think, of September it was passed. Yeah. And October is where the protests go really wild. In yeah. 2017, 2017, you have the anti-torture um, act passed, where it's all these things against torture, uh, police torturing suspects. But Amnesty International found at least 80... 82 to 86 instances of torture between 2017 and 2019. So yep. it's like you can put stuff into law, but is it actually going to be carried out? That's the real question. So I would want to ask you what your thoughts are on that. How can reform actually even be accomplished in Nigeria? Well, that, that, that's a very difficult one because even the <laughs> the, the last uh, protest at the Lake Togut, we saw the pictures, we saw the videos on the on internet. Even a very popular comedian, Mr. Macaroni, was amongst the people who were tortured. We saw them being tortured. They they they, they removed their clothes and they were beating them inside the bus. You know, so it's not a, really about reform. I think it's more about reforming the mind, the mindsets of people who put in the positions of authority. Uh, you know, reforming the minds of people who are, who are law enforcement agents, you know, and the armed forces, you know. Till date, if the military man comes after you, you know, what he does is to torture you, to humiliate you, you know, to treat you as if, to treat, treat you less than human, you know, to treat you as if you're an animal. And people see it as normal. You know, so that is why immediately you you have any confrontation with a military man, you become scared. You know, you may even find a way to run away. If not, they are going to deal with you in broad daylight, and nobody can do anything about it. You know, and we also see the police, the the so-called the disbanded SARS. You know, threatening young people that I will shoot you and nothing will happen. That has been a mantra in Nigeria for a very long time. I will shoot you and nothing will happen. I've been told that several times. I will shoot you, nothing will happen. And they've shot a lot of people, killed a lot, a lot of people. I know what? Nothing actually happened. You know, so is 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 more of a, a national transformation. You know, we need to begin to uh, we need to start uh, advocacy, you know, we need to start uh, organizing uh, seminars, we need to use both the electronic media and print media, you know. The the the, the governments should live up to their responsibility by training and retraining law enforcement agencies in Nigeria. They take the laws into their hands so much. It's not about paperwork. You can also, you can, you can do your paperwork, but at the end of the day, the people who are going to implement it, what happens to them when they believe that they can do anything and get away with it? Till date, there's still police brutality in Nigeria. It has not stopped. There's still police extortion. They are still police torture. It has not stopped. So it's about the reformation of the mind. We have to reform our minds because these people are Nigerians. They are not from the Mars. They are Nigerians. They are our brothers and sisters. If we do not reform their minds, we are wasting our time. Yes, sir. I agree with that. So I have a few more, just a few more questions uh, for you, sir. All right. Um, so. Uh, hmm. 
what are this is gonna be a, a little bit of a controversial question but what are specific or like what are examples of corruption within the nigerian government and how would they be resolved so i'm only asking this because i've seen for instance in 2015 there's they're still going through this case right the 2015 there was the whole dasuki gate where it was like, oh, 2 billion Naira were supposed to be used for the army, but they didn't go to the army. Where did they go? Then the question was, was it gone to the to the to President Jonathan's reelection? What was going on with that? And there were people in both in the government and in the media who were involved and implicated in that thing. And so there's a lot of examples of like whether or not, because some of these thing, cases are still ongoing, right? But there's a lot of examples of like all these like media, government, everybody tied up in some sort of scandal, how do they figure it out? So my question is, are there any examples of corruption in the government today and how would they be resolved? Well, I would, I would tell you for free that the salvaging this country rests on the shoulders of those of us who were born in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the millennials, you know? Our our forebears have not done have not done much. They put us in this mess. They put us in the corruption we we, we see today. There's a whole lot of instances of uh, bribery and corruption in the country, you know. But the one that is more close to my heart is this issue of unemployment, you know, because it's the root of all the insurgency the youth restiveness that we are experiencing in this country today. You know, you, you can imagine that the people who are operating this Boko Haram system are young people. They are people who are born in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and millennials, okay? You check out the bandits, the same thing. You check out the kidnappers, it's the same thing. You go through the armed robbers that we see today. It's still the same thing who are making the country uncomfortable, who are kidnapping students from, <laughs> from schools, you know, boarding students, you know, making life unbearable for the country. They are all young people. And what is the, what is the fundamental uh, issue about this? It's because they are jobless. They don't have where to go to work. And even when they apply, for instance, in Nigeria now, if you if you tell anybody about a vacancy, the next thing they'll ask you, do you know somebody there? You know, so we do not have strong institutions. There are no strong institutions in Nigeria. All the government institutions we have in Nigeria have been bastardized. Name it. Is it the police? Is it the army? Is it the air force? The air force is about recruiting right now, and we're on the we're we are, we are on their case. We've been appealing to them that by the time they start this recruitment on on the second of March. We are appealing to the new chief of air staff to ensure that the recruitment is done via due process. That is, he should be an equal opportunity employer. He should write his name in gold by making it very transparent, free, fair, and credible. Let everybody have, have a chance of getting employed in Nigeria. Today in Nigeria, if you don't have connection, if you're if you're if you're if you're part of the people, they have not, you know, the less privileged people, you don't have a chance at getting any employment. I've seen people who who graduated from the university since 2010, 2011, and they could not secure a job. Why? Because they don't have money to offer, they don't have sex to offer, they don't have connection, they don't have anybody that can give them a note, give this person a job. They cannot afford one million or two million. How, where do you expect the person to get the money? You know, so that is large scale corruption. It's affecting everybody. And the unemployment rate in Nigeria today is very high to the point that every family in Nigeria today has at least two or three people who have graduated from school who are not working. They have at least one or two persons who are skilled, but they don't have, they don't have any opportunity. To, to, to express themselves, you know, to become productive. So there, there's large scale corruption in government. And people who are in government today, what, all, all what they do is before the, uh, the vacancy comes out, 
they would have shared it amongst themselves, distributed it amongst themselves, you know, and their cronies and their family members. And if, if, a, if a situation arises where they are required to pay, they pay for it. They pay for it. For instance, we have Buhari's daughter who just came out of school and he's in, she's in NNPC. That position she's occupying today was never ad advertised. She was just given that employment because she's the president's daughter. And that is not supposed to be. We've been crying about that. So the people we have in government today, the APC government at the federal level and the PDP government at the state level, you know, they are the ones benefiting from it. So they don't want to say anything about it. You know, corruption is large scale. You can imagine that just, just this week, not even last week, just this week, the, the four army chiefs, the four service chiefs who did a very terrible job as securing the country, you know, with all the monies voted into security, they messed up, there was insurgency everywhere, there was bomb blast, there was kidnapping. It was as if nobody was in charge. And the Senate kept calling for their sack. Nigerians kept calling for their sack until Buhari just decided to fire them. The same Buhari who fired them recommended them to the Senate for confirmation to become ambassadors. <laughs> People who failed the country, you now want to export them to the international level. What do you expect them to go and do there? And we protested, we wrote petitions to the National Assembly, but it's so, it's so unfortunate that the Senate that we will have today is just a rubber stamp Senate. They're incompetent, they're inept, they're just a rubber stamp for the executive. They're a rubber stamp for Buare. Even the, the, the Senate president, Ahmed, Ahmed Lawa said it, that whatever Buare brings, they will confirm it. And that was exactly what he did. The petitions were thrown out. He said they lacked merit. Just one senator, Senator Nina Baribe, raised his voice to talk and they shut him down and said that the petitions lacked merit. They just confirmed them, ambassador. So today we have failed S service chiefs that would be sent to represent us in various countries of the world. So that is another level of corruption. There is no, people don't get things on merit. You know, so first of all, the solution to this problem is to build strong institutions. We need a very strong, our institutions are very weak. Look at the judiciary. The judiciary of recent in Abuja here, 49 uh, magistrates were appointed. It was not even advertised. It was children of former judges, retired judges, and people who, could, who can buy the employment that were just employed. You know, I was at the court the other day and the lawyers there were complaining to me. They were not given opportunity to apply, to even apply. <laughs> you know, I've seen a situation whereby somebody is in, is in Lagos or outside the country and he's called to come and pick up a job without even writing an application. When he now comes, he, he writes the application and they build up a file for him just because the employment has been bought for him or just because he's from a privileged home. So what you're saying is that the millions of people who are less privileged have been denied the opportunity of, of, of having employment, of, 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 of gainful employment. That is the situation we are facing in Nigeria today. So if we do not build strong institutions where the, 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 the means of siphoning public funds are blocked, you know, where, where, where the man who is a minister or a governor or in a position of authority finds it difficult. For instance, look at, I always give example with the United States of America. I spent four months in America. I saw how their system works. Their system is working. They have very good systems and structures that is working. You just come there and fit in. You don't have any choice than to align. You saw what happened between uh, Donald Trump and the incoming president. You know, imagine if that kind of thing happens in Nigeria. He will just get he will just get away scot free. But the system is there. The system is working. So we must make the system work, and the responsibility lies on our shoulders as young people. Yeah, I hear you on that. Sir, uh, are you open to do at least like 10 more minutes? Is that is that okay with you, sir? Yeah. Okay, so I think yeah, I'm going okay. Okay. I think I'm going to try and send you another link cuz this one is running out. The time remaining time is the only okay. two, 2 minutes. So, we'll just end it here and I'll send you another link and I'll send the recording of both to you afterwards once okay. they download from me. Okay. Thank you so much All so right. far. This has been great so far.